I was saying to folks in the first service, you know, we talk about love or talk about God's love, but for a lot of people, to ever really experience love in their lifetime just seems like a dream. It just seems like something so far out of their reach. In fact, some of us maybe here this morning have grown up without really knowing love, maybe even the love of a parent. Because of that, we've had to deal with just a sense of rejection or fear, whatever it may be. And, and then you come to church or you hear about the gospel, you hear about God, and and again, you just can't fathom this idea that God would love you or that God would love you so profoundly, so unconditionally. There are many people, even in the church, who have accepted Christ and who understand the gospel that Jesus came and died for my sin, but they still kind of live with this distorted view of God the Father. He just seems to be up there, kind of judgmental, whatever projection of our own earthly fathers many times may be, and, and they don't really grasp the incredible love of God the Father. And yet Jude says that for those of us who know the Lord, he calls us, he invites us, he exhorts us to actually keep ourselves in God's love. You know, a lot of us, we know what it is when we talk about God's love. We're using it in the context, well, I know the Bible says that God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. So I kind of understand that element that God did something loving for me. But few of us, I think, really have come to learn what it is or how it is that we can actually live in God's love. We can live in that place where no matter where we are or what we're going through, no matter what thoughts come our way or struggles we may have, that we are never out of the reach of God's love, that God's love is able to touch us and impact us. John said in 1 John 4, 19, he said, we love because God first loved us. That is beautiful. Not only did he first love us and that he saved us, but he wants us to understand that anything he asks of us to live in love, to respond in love, to love him. All of that is out of, the, out of the, the resource, the well of love that he gives to us first. And he says, you can draw on this love. You can live in this love. You can love out of this love. You can experience and, and minister this agape love. In fact, Jesus has said previously in verse 18, he says, where God's love is, there's no fear. Because God's perfect love drives out fear. You see, when my relationship with God is built on my knowledge of his love for me, then not only do I receive that love, not only do I actually live in that love, but I'm actually being changed by the power of that love, by the power of the knowledge of his love for me that I can experience as I walk with him. If not, what happens if I walk outside of that love, if I, if I stop growing in that love, living in his love for me, but instead I kind of just embrace, as we've said many times, just this lifestyle of what it means to be a Christian, then what I find is not very long before my relationship with him is no longer one of experiencing love and reciprocating love, but it becomes one of striving. It becomes one of trying to earn love. It becomes one of uncertainty, and my, my feeling oftentimes of, of love or being loved is oftentimes dependent upon my circumstance. And the Lord doesn't want it that way. He says, keep yourselves in God's love. I think for many of us in the Western culture, at least, we try to grow in our love for God. And then so we read the Word, or we attend classes, or attend church, and all in the effort of just trying to grow my knowledge of God, or trying to love God more. You know, we do more things, or get involved in things, or sign up for things, or whatever, and we're just trying to show that we love God, or grow in that love, when what we really need is just to grow in our knowledge of His love for us. Just imagine if we took that energy, and rather than trying to earn God's love, instead we just researched and delved into and explored this vast ocean of God's love for us and actually learned to live in that love. That really is the secret to what the Bible calls the, the overcoming life. You see, my, my greatest strength in, in maintaining a life that is pleasing to God and is fulfilling in Christ, my, my greatest weapon, spiritual weapon against the powers of darkness, it's not just learning more cliches, right? It's not just more faith statements. The real secret to power in wrestling spiritual forces is to grow in this unwavering certainty of God's love for me. That's what I really need. That is the power of his love. Wherever I am, whatever I'm going through, his love for me has not changed. He's always there for me. I want to share two things this morning about God's love. The first thing I want us to understand, I've shared this concept before, I believe, because it's always so forefront in my mind. 
And try to get your mind around this. Do you realize, according to the Word of God, that God the Father loves you as much as He loves Jesus? Let that sink in. God the Father loves you as much as He loves Jesus. Let me give you the Scripture. Jesus prayed in John 17, 24, Father, you loved me before the world began. Now, we have no problem with that, right? That's not hard to get our mind around. God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit have always existed. They are perfect love. They love one another perfectly. Jesus said, Father, you have loved me before the world began. Now, try to grasp, okay, how great that love is. Okay, we think that's no problem. I can see the Father loving Jesus that way. But then Jesus makes this incredible statement. He says, Father, you love them as much as you love me. So let that sink in. Number one, Father, you have loved me before the world began. Your love has never stopped. And Father, you love these people, your people, as much as you love me. He also prayed in verse 26, they will have the same love that you have for me, and I will be in them. I will live in them. How can that be? How can that be? It's too profound for me to understand. But one of the things I do know from reading the Word of God is that Jesus and I have the same Heavenly Father. And understand that just as Jesus did not earn His Father's love, nor could He earn His love by going to the cross, the Father simply loved His Son. In the same way, there is nothing you and I can do that makes God love us any more or makes God love us any less. We cannot earn God's love. We can earn, you might say, his pleasure, just like our own children, right? We don't have favored children per se, but they can do certain things that make us pleased with them. We can do certain things that you may say earn God's blessing, but there is not a single thing you can do to actually earn God's love. God says, I love you. I love you. In Jeremiah 31, he says, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love. Say that word, everlasting everlasting love. And get this, he says, with unfailing love, it never diminishes, it never decreases, it never increases, it never wavers, it never changes. With unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. What's he saying? He's saying, you understand, I didn't start loving you when you decided to start getting your act together. I didn't start loving you the moment you decided to meet Jesus and surrender your life to him. He says, I drew you to myself through Jesus. Why? Because you were already loved. That's why you came to me through Jesus, because I loved you. I loved you, and that's never changed. In fact, God not only loves you as much as he loves Jesus. How many believe that God is all-knowing? God is God, right? God has always existed. So in other words, from the very beginning of his existence, which there is no beginning, get your mind around that, for as long as God has existed, he has known everything, right? Ever since God has existed, therefore, he has known you. And so what he's saying here in the scripture we just read is not only do I love you as much as I love my son Jesus, I have loved you for as long as I have loved my son Jesus. I have loved you from the very moment I knew you. And how long has God known you? Since forever. There's never been a time that he has not known you. He has always known all things. And so he has always known you. And he says, I have loved you as long as I have loved Jesus. I have loved you forever. There is no beginning to his love, and there is no end to his love. Now, I know for some of you folks, you're probably sitting there saying, well, pastor, that's very encouraging. That's wonderful. But it kind of sounds like you're compromising the gospel. Because God is love. God is loving but he's also just. He's also holy, right? And in fact, there's a few preachers on YouTube you see sometimes, great guys, you know, men of God, love the Lord, teach the word of God, but they just kind of seem to have this bee in their bonnet. And whenever they get together, the four or five of them, they're always picking at charismatic churches and charismatic pastors and things of the spirit, and they always have the answers, you know. I kind of watch them for comic relief once in a while. It's kind of like, I don't mean it badly, but it's kind of like, hey, you don't play the game, you don't get to make the rules, okay? 
Believe or don't believe what you want. I'd rather walk in what I know than sit around and criticize what I don't. Anyways, uh, you don't know who I'm talking about anyway, probably. But, but they, they talk about quite often, too, these preachers who talk about, you know, God's love and God's grace. And, of course, they say we understand that. But, you know, they're compromising God's holiness in the name of love, in the name of grace. They're compromising the gospel. Well, I believe the gospel, essentially the gospel is repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's essentially the message Jesus preached. But we understand the good news, right? Oftentimes we turn to John 3, 16, 17, if you want to hear the good news. I want to read it together. I have it in a New Century version, so I don't have it memorized by old King James. But, but so here we go. Let's read it together. John 3, 16, 17. Jesus said, God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him may not be lost but have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to judge the world guilty, but to save the world through him. Now, if you study the New Testament, you understand that the reason why many of the Jews initially rejected Jesus was because their understanding of the Messiah was that he was going to come and do what? He was going to come, save Israel, and then judge the world guilty. That's why they were disappointed. All the prophecies of old was he would come and, and his winnowing fork and he would judge the world and so on. And they're thinking, oh, we can't wait the Messiah to come. Not realizing themselves that if he had come and judged the world, they'd be judged too. If he came in fire, they weren't going to be spirit because they were just as sinful, if not even worse, because they were supposed to know God. Okay? And so he doesn't come that way. And for a lot of believers in the church today, that's their mindset. I just can't wait until Jesus shows up and he just fries the whole world. I mean, the world is just, you know, going to hell in the handbasket. It's just, this is just that. It's the other thing. I can't wait till Jesus comes. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the world. I came so the world might be saved. And so, yes, God is love. 1 John 4, 7, 8. God is also perfectly just. Nahum says he will not leave the guilty unpunished. So where's the balance? I believe the balance is simply this. That as perfect love, God hates and will judge those things that threaten those whom he loves. But as perfectly holy, he will also punish sin justly and fairly. So you see, in his love, what has he done? He knows that all of us deserve judgment. We all deserve punishment. I think it's John 3, 36. That whoever believes in the Son, Jesus says, whoever believes in me has life. Whoever does not believe in me, that is, whoever has rejected me, shall not see life, but the wrath of God or the judgment of God remains on him. Why did God send his Son, Jesus, into the world? Because as the perfect judge, he knew that his wrath hovered over us because of our sin and rebellion. But he did not want us to be destroyed. So what does he do? He swoops in under that wrath and he snatches it out from that judgment by placing the judgment on his son Jesus who bore our sin. So if we will trust in him, what happens? Then our sin is forgiven. That's what it means to be saved. We forget what it means to be saved. We have been saved. We have been delivered, snatched by the skin of our teeth away from a wrath that we deserve. But we deserve it. What does that mean? To me, what that means is God is holy. God is just. But more than anything else, he is love. He is love. If he wasn't love, he, if he was holiness and judgment and wrath first, I mean, he's all those things in perfect balance. But if that's all he was, that would have won out of love. But love won out. But it won out by satisfying the law, satisfying the justice and the judgment that you and I deserve. But it was because of his great love for us. In fact, he says elsewhere, he says, if I loved you that much while you were rebellious and had no thought or care about me, how much more do you think now I love you as you're my children? Not that his love changes, but we ought to be secure in that knowledge that we're now his sons and his daughters. And so in his love, he made a way for us to escape the punishment, but he will not force us to receive his love. But we need to understand, if we reject his love, that he demonstrated through this act of salvation. Friends, there's nowhere else we can go for safety. There's nowhere else. The only way we escape that, escape that judgment we deserve is to be sheltered in his love, to live in his love. You see, you can't blame God if you leave this world separated from him and cast into hell. 
It is not his fault whatsoever, no more than you can blame a parent who loves their child unconditionally, and yet they choose to rebel, and they choose to ruin their life through a series of wrong choices. It's not the parent's fault. They have every agency, every ability to be free and whole and to live life to the full, but they've made that choice. And God is the same way in his love toward us. So we need to understand that God loves us, and he loves us unconditionally. In fact, Paul says God demonstrated, he proved his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. What else can he do but show us that? So he loves us. And the amazing thing is my father loves me as much as he loves Jesus. And he loves me for as long as he has loved Jesus. And that will never change. But the second thing is, is that God's love will keep you in your struggles. We know that for all of us, it's one thing to, to kind of stay in the joy, to have a you know, joyful disposition when everything is going well. But when things start falling apart, it can be really easy to lose that joy, to lose that love. That's why the Lord says, I want you to keep yourselves in my love at all times. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 16, we know how much God loves us, but this is the key part. And we have put our trust in him. See, that's the shift. I can know God loves me academically, cerebrally. I can say, okay, that makes sense. God did this and this. Okay, he loves me. So I believe that he loves me. But that's not the same thing as putting my trust in the knowledge of his love. That's not the same thing as when things go sideways. Rather than turning from God, being angry at God, shaking my fist at God, instead I say, God, I don't understand, but I know you love me and I'm coming to you. I'm leaning into you. I'm going to sit and listen to you. I'm going to get away from the lies, get away from my own thoughts, I'm going to get away from what's going on. I'm going to come away and say, Father, I don't know what's going on, but what I know is you love me. That's where you want to start. I know you love me. And then allow the Lord to be able to soar through some of that stuff and lead you in his way as he tries to work that out with you. We put our trust in him. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. John's talked about those who live in a love that's been, that's been created out of a relationship with God. He's not just saying, hey, everybody who loves, you know, kind of hippy-dippy, you know, Volkswagen van, you know, marijuana, you know, you know, the old days, for those of us who are old enough, you know, that's, that's kind of free love. Well, if, you'd lo you know, if you love like that, then you must be in God. No, I'm not talking about that, okay? <laughs> Does that make sense? There's a Greek word in there somewhere I can throw in, I don't know, to clarify. But uh, he's talking about for those of us who've experienced his love. Because we can step outside of that. We can get back into the flesh real easy. But he says, if you learn to love and trust in him and walk in that love, then you'll discover that God also lives in you. If we live in God's love, we will always live in God. That's the key. To really be in Christ, again, is not just something I believe. It's actually living in his love. It's living in that awareness of his love. It's having that, that love for us being a strength for us. In fact, the word live means to stay in a state of expectancy. So what he's saying is that God wants me to expect his love to be renewed in me every single day. God wants me to live my life from the vantage point that God loves me, that God has always loved me, and that God will always love me, that that doesn't change. Imagine how different your life can be if you really understand how greatly, how thoroughly you're loved by God. Imagine how your attitude changes. Imagine how it changes how you treat other people. Imagine your vantage point when things come your way, your, your default automatically, when you learn to live in that love, in that communion with him. I wonder how often we, we tend to dart in and out of God's love depending on how we feel. Again, we feel like God loves us when things are going well, but, but we're unsure when we start to struggle. Or maybe sometimes we fail if we let God down. We're not too sure if he really loves us. But you know what? Those are the very times that we need to most trust in his love, that we need most to turn to him and say, Father, I just need a fresh feeling of your love, a fresh revelation of your love. I believe the Lord would say no matter what you face, you must learn to never doubt my love for you. As simple as it may sound, friends, never doubt his love for you. And I want to ask you this morning, where are you? I mean, you may be in a place this morning, you say, Pastor, if I'm honest, I just kind of feel dry. Or maybe you're in a place that you're going through some kind of difficulty. 
or, or maybe you're going through something in your marriage relationship or, or there's stress in your home or you're just feeling overwhelmed by some sin it seems like that you just can't get, get a handle on, you just can't seem to overcome it. It's something that you hate, but it's just there all the time. Whatever it may be, friends, this is the time more than any other that you have to know that God loves you and that his love is not just some syrupy, wishy-washy feeling that kind of makes bad things disappear for a moment. But his love is actually a tangible strength that will give you the backbone to stand through whatever it is you're going through. Friends, God's love really is our only hope and comfort. It's the knowledge of his love. It's not what we can muster up. It's not what we can you know, convince ourselves of. It's the revelation of God's incredible love for me and how connected he wants to be to me, how real he wants to be to me. That is our hope and strength. The psalmist said in Psalm 25, Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember, for you are good, O Lord. As I was saying to folks in the first service, we have to be so careful that when we come to the Lord, that we, when we're appealing to the Lord for whatever it may be, for something we need, wherever we find ourselves, whatever it is, never appeal to God on the basis of your own goodness. But just as importantly, never stay away from the Lord on the basis of your sin or of your situation. Neither one. Appeal to the Lord, the psalmist says, on this basis alone, that he loves you. In fact, he not only loves you, but his love for you goes back further than anything you've ever done. You can never go back so far and say, at that point, God didn't love me. There's nothing you can do in your life and say, at this point, God stopped loving me. There's nothing you will ever do that God will stop loving you. Don't leave this world without knowing his love, then you'll face his wrath. But his love is there to the very last breath that we breathe. He says, I love you. And it doesn't change. That's really what the cross is all about. It's the Father saying on the cross, right? You remember that analogy, that story? God, how much do you love me? And he stretched out his arms and he said this much. That's what the Father was saying on the cross. I love you this much. But you need to receive my love. You need to live in the knowledge of my love. You need to be changed by the power of my love. You know, Vanessa and I had the privilege this past week. It was such a blessing to hear, such an encouragement, as difficult as the situation was. But we were talking to a young lady in our congregation who loves the Lord, and she was just blindsided by this crisis in her family, in her home. Didn't see it coming. And it was just one of those things that really would just leave most people just reeling. In fact, it would leave many people just angry and in pain and probably lashing back at the person that hurt them. And so as we were having a conversation about the situation, she had stated how in her pain that she turned to God. She turned to her Heavenly Father. She could have shaken her fist. She could have got upset. She could have, you know, shut God out, whatever the case may be. But she turned to God, and she said, I was sitting there on my bed, on the side of my bed, and just turning to God. And she said, all of a sudden, I just felt the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. She said, God, baptize me in the Holy Spirit. And she said, I just, just his love began to well up on me, and I began to praise the Lord and speak in other tongues and just felt the love of God envelop me. And it was so refreshing. I got to say, as a pastor, my friends, this was so refreshing to see, so refreshing to hear. But as we listened to her response to this situation, we were so encouraged to hear her determination to actually live in God's love in this season of her life, to walk in that love that she experienced to the point of not allowing pain and hurt to dictate her actions, but even to the point of demonstrating nothing but love to the person that hurt her. You see, my friends, God's love is not just some empty emotion that helps you to forget the struggles for the moment. His love is even more than a feeling. His love is the tangible presence of the Holy Spirit of God coming upon you. In fact, oftentimes the baptism with the Holy Spirit has been described as liquid love, just liquid love washing over the one who receives. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us hope and joy and strength to go through, to make it through, and to overcome. Why? Because we can actually live in the power of his love. 
I think of the words of the Apostle Paul I want to close with this morning. He said in chapter 8, Can anything separate us from the love of Christ, that, the love Christ has for us? Can troubles or problems or sufferings, hunger, nakedness, danger, a violent death? But let me read that again. He says, Can anything separate us from the love that Christ has for us? And he lists these very practical things that believers go through. And believers in his day were actually paying with their lives. And he says, no, in all these things, we are completely victorious. How? Through hyping ourselves up, faith statements? No. We are completely victorious because of the revelation of God's love for me. And it's not just something I received a long time ago, but in the midst of those things, if I will turn to God, not harden my heart to God, but say, God, you proved your love to me. And whatever I feel right now, I'm not going to give him the lie that you don't care. I'm going to understand that I may not understand, but it doesn't change who you are. You love me. You are love. I turn to you, Father, and I pray for a fresh baptism of your love and of your spirit, that I can honor you in the midst of this, O oh God, and that I can demonstrate your love through it as well. Frederick Lehman was a California businessman who lost everything in his business at one time, and all he could find was a job back in the early 1900s in a warehouse for packing oranges and lemons into crates. That was his job. And one Sunday morning, he said, I was at church, and the pastor was preaching on God's love. He said, I was so struck by this revelation of God's great love for me. He said, when I got home, he said, I couldn't shake it. I could barely sleep. And the next day, while I'm on the assembly line, just working there with oranges and lemons, oranges and lemons, he said, this song began to formulate in my mind. And these beautiful words, he said, and I, I, was, I had no paper, so he said, I just grabbed pieces of broken crate, and I took a pencil, and I wrote out the stanza that came to my mind, and and he said, by the end of the day, I had two stanzas and a verse on the, all these pieces of wood. And I took them home to translate them onto paper. Well, see, back in the day, this might sound silly, but back in that day, actually, you couldn't really publish a song unless you had at least three, three stanzas and a verse. He only had two. So he said, I can't publish it yet, but it was a beautiful song. And he couldn't get a third verse. Nothing would come to his mind. But then one day he remembered a poem that someone had given to him. It was a, a well-known poem from about 200 years previously. And it was actually a poem that was found written on a prison cell wall. The prisoner there was uh, sentenced to ex for execution, don't know what the crime was, whether they were guilty or not, but they, they had made their peace with God, and this poem just seemed to be something they kept in front of them as they moved toward their last days, just to be sure of God's love. Well, eventually that man died, that prisoner died, and when the painters came to repaint the cell, one of the painters saw this beautiful poem, these beautiful words, this stanza, one stanza, and they decided, I can't paint over that before I jot those words down. They did, and that later became a well-known poem and actually became the third stanza of the hymn that Frederick Lehman was writing, and these are the words of the poem. It says, could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stock on earth a quill, that is a pen, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. That's my favorite hymn. It's called The Love of God. And I've asked the worship team this morning to sing it. Can we stand together? As we close, and you feel free to slip out if you need to a little bit later, but we want to sing this hymn together and lift our voice. And if you're here this morning and you know Jesus Christ, I want to ask you this simple question. Do you know without a shadow of a doubt that God loves you? Does his love actually influence your life today? Does it influence what you think and what you choose to believe, how you conduct yourself? In fact, as I said to the folks in the first service, and I challenged myself, if you really know the love of God, if the love of God really has been shed abroad in your heart, you know one of the evidence? You're going to talk to somebody about Jesus this week. Because you know what? We tend to talk about people we love, don't we? They always come up in the conversation. When you love somebody, they're forefront in your mind, and you're looking for an excuse 
to talk about that person, right? Grandchild, spouse, girlfriend, whatever it may be. And I want to encourage you, if it's been a long time, if there's been spiritual dryness, would you just come before the Lord again, kind of like Peter did during the persecution, and say, Lord, would you give us boldness to go back out there and keep sharing the gospel? Would you give us that boldness? What does the Bible say? The place where they were meeting was shaken again, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and boldness. And what did they go out? And they, they talked about Christ. Why? Because as Peter said, we can't help but talk about him. He's so real. Oh, that you would know his love. And the Lord wants us to know his love because of the wholeness and the freedom that his love brings to us. Do you realize how much of the devil's lies are just shattered by one simple phrase? Yeah, but Jesus loves me. He loves me. And that love's not kind of sloppy grace, right? That love is a strength that says, because you love me, Lord, I have a resource in you. I don't have to be this way. I don't have to be bound in that sin. I don't have to think this way. I don't have to be depressed. I don't have to be medicated. Yes, I've said it. I don't have to have all that kind of stuff. Your love can set me free. Your love can heal me. Your love can make me whole. Your love can break depression. His love can break depression, friends. The spirit of depression. His love can shatter that spirit. The revelation of his love, the fullness of his Holy Spirit. He will break every shackle. He'll set his people free. We need a fresh revelation of his love.